Good evening. It's a pleasure to stand before you again during this midweek time. It's uh, kind of a, a day that we can all look to and appreciate for the glory of God's creation was very visible during this day. And we need to thank him every day for the great blessings that he bestows upon us and the good things that we have in this life. We have been looking this week at those lessons that are more of a positive nature, but especially, Brother Greg said, focusing on joy. We've looked at the joy that ought to be ours as Christians and how God has intended for us to have that joy. And we're going to consider in our lesson this evening a source of joy that sometimes is overlooked by those who claim to be children of God. They can understand joy in the Father because of the great love that the Father bestows upon each one of us, the great blessings that are ours. They easily can find joy in the Son because of the wondrous things that as we saw last night, the wonders of the cross that Jesus has done for us and how he continues to serve us and allow us to live lives that uh, bring glory to him and the Father and allow us to live from day to day with the hope of heaven upon us. But sometimes brethren fail to look to one another for joy. And yet I believe God has designed the church, especially the local church we're talking about, God has designed that local congregation to be those individuals who serve to help one another, encourage one another, lift up one another, and find joy in one another. As was prayed, this world is in chaos, and there is evil all around us, and we ought to look to one another. Our assemblies, not only our assemblies together, but our relationship one with another as a haven from this world, that we can find peace and solace and joy with those who are of like precious faith. So that's going to be our lesson this evening. As we introduce it, I want to start by saying, parents naturally love their children. It's unnatural when a parent does not love that one they have brought into the world. Parents love their children. And yet, some disappoint them, cause them anxiety and sorrow. They are those that possibly might rebel against them. They're those who want their own will instead of the will of the parents. They're some that are, are as that prodigal or wayward son that we considered in Luke 15, that want to go their own way and have nothing to do with mom and dad. But yet, at the same time, there are others who delight them and bring them great joy. One of the things I've found over the years when I go and visit with people and you go into their homes and you'll see the pictures of all the children. Maybe the children are grown now and there's grandchildren. And you get those people talking about those children. You get them talking about the grandchildren and their eyes light up. There's a grin on their face and they're just filled with smile because of the joy that these offspring bring into their lives. And so we, in the physical realm, understand that offspring can be either good and bring joy or cause anxiety and sorrow. When we look to the spiritual sense, in establishing many local churches, the Apostle Paul had many children in the faith. If you look to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 22, there he's talking about Timothy, the young man that he met at Lystra. And he tells the saints of Philippi of Timothy, you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. That was a, a father and son relationship almost. Yes, Timothy had his own father, but... His own father was Greek while his mother was a Jew. And yet he found in Paul that father figure that could help him along and cause him to grow spiritually. And Timothy brought great joy to Paul. As a matter of fact, some of the last words that we know from the Apostle Paul was to have Timothy come to him so that he could be comforted by him and receive strength and courage from him. 
But Timothy was not the only child in the faith that Paul had. As he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, he said unto them, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul recognized these, in a sense, as his children. As far as we know, Paul never married. He never had any children, physical children of his own. But he had children in many places in that he had begotten them through the gospel as he traveled through the known world at that time. And therefore, Paul took count of those children that he had begotten in the faith. But there were some who disappointed him. Those Corinthians that we had just read that he had written to were a disappointment to him at that time. There were some in the area of Galatia who were also disappointing to him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. He said, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal, where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? These individuals should have given themselves fully and wholly to the Lord. And Paul was reminding them that they needed to be living lives in accordance with the will of God. But they were not doing that. Their attitudes were carnal, thus their actions were carnal. They were filled with such things as envy, strife, and division. And all it takes is a reading of this first epistle of Paul to them to understand how desperate their situation was and how disappointed Paul was in them. To the Galatians, the saints in the area of Galatia, he wrote in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Here he had taught these individuals the purity of Jesus Christ's gospel, the good news of salvation, but they had allowed others to turn them away from that gospel, and they perverted the gospel of Christ. And in that, Paul was greatly disappointed. But on the other hand, others delighted him, such as the Philippians, who were his joy and his crown. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, my beloved, and long for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Quite often, and I'm guilty of it too, matter of fact, I'm guilty of it this week, we read Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, and we kind of pull it out of its context. We cite it, but we cite it alone. But look in what context Paul is saying this. He is telling them to be of the same mind. He is telling them to be those who give themselves fully and wholly to the Lord and to one another. And in that way, not only would be they be his joy and crown, but the joy and the crown to one another. Those who comprise the church today are much the same. In some, I believe both we and the Lord are disappointed. Not only have I, did I preach the gospel on a full-time basis for 45 years, but the last 25 of those years, I was an elder in the church in Tallahassee. And having been serving as an elder, you deal with problems. And I hope you all pray for your elders. They're 
I, I, I imagine they're, and I don't know what they're dealing with, but I imagine they deal with problems you don't even know about. And it's a burden, it's a stress, it's a strain. But they would tell you, in some of the people over the years, they have been disappointed. Because they've either turned their back upon the Lord, or they've been lukewarm in their service to the Lord. Or they have improper attitudes, not only toward the Lord, his word, but especially to, one, to other Christians. And when we are disappointed in them, so many times the Lord would be disappointed in, all, in them also. But there are others today who are a joy and a crown to the church in which they worship and serve. We can look, Sandy and I can look fondly back over the years to the congregations we've been associated with and think of people who were just a joy and a crown to us. Those people that, oh, were just always there, always supportive, always positive, always doing that which was good, helping others, and seeking to do more. Those are the kind of people that every congregation needs. The church can't do without them, for they are the faithful. Quite often, preachers, out of necessity, have to preach on sins and weakness of members of the, who claim to be members of the Lord's body, who are weak, who are maybe even failing. And we don't get to address in a positive way enough our gratitude for those who are so faithful, that can be counted on, that can be trusted, that can be so edifying to us and to others. They are the joy and the crown, the brethren who are faithful. What makes them that way? Well, when we look to the scriptures, we understand that faithfulness is required. We should not be faithful just out of the sense of duty. We've already talked about we ought to be serving the Lord by, uh, out of love. But at the same time, we need to understand this is not an optional thing. The Lord expects and demands faithfulness of each one of us. The Lord doesn't require greatness as man thinks of it. None of us may aspire to greatness and may uh, attain to greatness in this world as the world views it, but we can be great in the sight of the Lord by being faithful individuals because the Lord doesn't require greatness of us, but he does require faithfulness. To the church at Smyrna, the Lord through John the Apostle wrote, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, or unto the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. The second death, eternal separation from God, and the lake of fire and brimstone. But notice what the Lord is saying to these people. You're going to suffer because you're standing for me and standing with me. I know that. But if you will be faithful, if you will remain faithful, I'll give you that crown of life. That was the same thing that the Apostle Paul anticipated in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And it's something that we can anticipate if we are faithful. And notice what the Lord included in this letter. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear? Most of us have two of them. Therefore, we need to hear what's being said. We need to understand that we need to be faithful individuals also. And if we go back to the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 25, the parables that are found there demonstrate this principle. <coughs> Pardon me. There's the parable of the ten virgins. How five were prepared for the Lord's return, but five were not. That five remained faithful to the calling that they had, and five did not. Then there's the parable of the talents, where the master goes away to a far country and he entrusts goods to 
his servants. To one he gave five talents, to one he gave two, to the other he gave one, each according to his ability. And you know what happened. The five-talent man, upon the master's return, was faithful to his master's bidding and gained five talents more. The two-talent man did the same thing. He gained two talents more. But you know what happened to that one-talent man? He was not faithful to what the master had commanded him. And that which he had was taken away from him. It doesn't take a great scholar or a great genius, I believe, to understand what the Savior is saying in that. That there is going to be an accounting. Accounting of his people. And if we are not faithful, if we are not living a life that is of faithful service unto the Lord, there's going to be serious repercussions. For Christians are to be faithful stewards. God has entrusted his people to people. You ever think about that? Jesus describes himself in John chapter 10, for example, as his chief shepherd. The good shepherd. But yet, our elders are called shepherds. Why? Because the Lord, in his wisdom, has invested power in them that they're able to look out for the souls of those who are in their charge to help them remain faithful, to do that which is good. We are, all of us are to be faithful stewards of that which the Lord has entrusted to us. Paul was a faithful steward of his work and the word that he had been given. In 1 Corinthians 4 again, verses 1 and 2, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Again and again and again in the New Testament, we see the need to remain faithful. A number of years ago, Keith Sharp wrote an article in Truth Magazine that he entitled Worship of the Church. And in that article, he said this, God does not require that you possess a beautiful voice to sing his praises, but he does command that you possess a beautiful life. One cannot live a sinful life and offer holy worship to God. That's why it's so important that we remain faithful, so that our worship will be acceptable to our God, so that God will view us as his own children. Seeing that we are to be faithful, what are some characteristics of the faithful? Now, quite often, when brethren talk about, or, or you'll hear them ask the question, is he or she a faithful Christian? Do you know what they mean most of the time? Do they attend three services a week? And that's about it. If they're there Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, they are a faithful Christian. My friends, that falls far short of the scriptural definition of a faithful Christian. There's much more to being a Christian than occupying a pew. There's much more to being a Christian than attending the assemblies. A faithful Christian, that is. Well, what are some of those qualities? The first one I want to share with you is that the faithful are willing individuals. Not willful, but willing. I want to share two passages with you. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and the second one, 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 8, it says, For I bear witness according to their ability... Yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Now, Paul is talking about the saints in Macedonia, northern Greece at that time. And he's talking about, and we're going to touch on this just a little bit later in the lesson, but he's talking about the gracious way that they helped the poor saints in the area of Jerusalem and Judea. And you notice what he said. They did according to to their ability, even beyond what anybody ever thought they could do. Why? Because they were freely willing. And he goes on to say, they gave themselves to the Lord. In the 12th verse of that chapter, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. But there has to be that willing mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, when it talks about giving unto the Lord. 
The Lord loves a cheerful giver. We're not to give out of necessity. We're not to give grudgingly. We're to be willing to sacrifice, to share, so that the work of the Lord can go forward, so that needy saints can have their needs met, so the work can go on and the gospel be preached many times all over the world. It is willing individuals, willing to sacrifice, willing to give themselves to their brethren and to the Lord that accomplish those sorts of things. And that's what the Lord expects of those who are his people. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, he's telling Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good. Let them be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. We ought to be individuals who are willing to share with one another and not just in finances, but our lives, our care, our compassion, and our love. Well, there are those who are willing and they are a blessing wherever they are. They are a joy and a crown. Others do what they are asked, and that's good. When we have children, we, when we ask them to do something and they do it, we're pleased with that. But there are others who are unwilling to do anything. You really can't count on them for much. They may come to the assemblies, punch the time clock for being there, and then go their way. You don't hear from them in the week. You don't see them in the week. Sometimes you don't even see them at the other assemblies because they've done their duty. And they're not willing to give themselves to the Lord or to their fellow saints. And I'm going to say something here. Usually, in a congregation, when you have those who complain the loudest and whine the most, or in reality, those who do nothing. And that's so sad. They're depressing people. But not only are they depressing people, they're destructive people. They're destructive to themselves because they're not faithful and willing as the Lord would have them to be. They're destructive to others because they bring others down instead of building them up. And they're destructive to the work in general because many times as an elder, I can tell you, the elders have to spend their time working with people like that instead of reaching out and carrying the gospel to others. We need to be willing individuals to give ourselves to the Lord and to one another if we're going to be considered faithful. The second quality is the ability to see. What I mean by that is they have vision. Remember in John chapter 4, Jesus was traveling from Judea to Galilee. And he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Well, Jews at that time did not travel through Samaria because they considered the Samaritans mongrels and had nothing to do with them. And normally when a Jew was going from Judea to Galilee, he would go down to Jericho, cross the Jordan River, go up the east side of the Jordan, cross, under, uh, cross the river again under the Sea of Galilee, and then go to where he was going in the province of Galilee. But Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. And that was because he knew that woman would be at that well. She was an immoral, ungodly woman. But Jesus talked to her. And revealed himself to her. She says, I know when Messiah comes, he will do all things. And he said, the one who speaks to you, that is he. So Jesus, having sent the disciples off to get food, talked with this woman and brought her to a belief in him as the Son of God, as the Messiah. Well, the disciples came back, and John continues the account, and in John chapter 4, he says, at this point, his disciples came after the woman had gone back into the city. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? 
Then they went out of the city and they came to him. But in the meantime, while all this was going on in the city and the woman was talking about Jesus to her fellow citizens, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi or teacher, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know, spiritual things, to accomplish the will of the Father. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has he brought, has anyone brought him anything to eat? They were still thinking in physical terms. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. The disciples at this time did not have vision. They were not seeing things the way they should. They were still focused upon the physical. They couldn't understand why he was talking to this woman. They wouldn't have done it. It was against all social customs. But Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Look to the fields. You say it's not harvest time yet, but the fields are already white for harvest. And he was talking spiritual harvest. They needed to have that vision. They needed to see what life is about. They needed to see the importance of giving themselves over to things of a spiritual nature. And my friends, so do we. So do we. Many churches fail because they lack vision. They fail to plan for the future. They fail to reach out to others. They're happy with the status quo. They keep that little closed circle of people. And that's not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants us to see the need to reach out to others, to carry the gospel to them, to be living before them so that they can see us as lights in the world and cause them to want to come to Christ, to have those same things that we possess as his disciples. But they not only see the needs, they also see the possibilities. I can remember as a young Christian, my father was still living, and I would go to the business meetings in the congregation there that didn't have elders at the time. And we would go to the business meetings, and uh, they would address the needs of the congregation, whether the light bill got paid this month, uh, how much money we owed on the mortgage, and all that kind of stuff. But there was no real vision for reaching out. There was no plans of how we might reach people in our community. There was no plans for helping other preachers in parts of the world. We need to see those possibilities. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, we said the other day, citing Paul in Philippians 4.13. So many churches sadly are afflicted by pessimism. Oh, the world's so ugly, the world's so wicked. We're so few, we're so poor, what can we do? That's self-defeating. And you're not going to do anything if you don't think you can do anything. Therefore, a characteristic of the faithful is optimism. Of all people on the face of the earth, we ought to be optimistic because we have the Lord on our side. There's a passage that's probably very familiar to you, even the young children when you go to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Because there was Israel, poised in the valley, the Philistines on the other side of the valley. And Israel was scared under King Saul to do a thing. The Philistine giant came out and taunted them. And they still wouldn't move. David, a young shepherd boy, comes to gain food to his brothers. He goes, what's going on here? And they tell him, and he says, I'll do something about this. And so he faces that Philistine giant when a whole army was afraid of him. And in verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17, it says, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. Today the battle is still the Lord's. And the Lord is the head of his army. We are to don the armor of God. Complete protection. And the only offensive weapon we have is the sword and spirit, the word of God. But we are to take that spirit forth. And we are to wield it and use it. And not be pessimistic that nobody wants to hear anymore. Nobody cares about the gospel anymore. My friends, if you try, you might be surprised. There are a lot of folks out there who can still be touched. Who still will give obedience unto Jesus Christ. They're optimistic because they believe all things can be done. As we said, I can do all things through, strength, through God who strengthens me. Will we convert the whole city of Columbus overnight? No. But it doesn't stop us from being optimistic that we can reach one, two, three, four souls, maybe more. They believe that things can be done. And they rejoice in the Lord that they have the opportunity to do it. I've been blessed for all these years to be supported to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank my God every day. Do you thank God for the opportunity you have to be of service to him and to help others see Christ? Being optimistic, they are boosters. What do I mean by that? They're those who encourage. The other day I read Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 to you. We're going to read it again. Because I want you to look at it again. Let us consider one another. Why? To stir up love and good works. That's the attitude we have towards one another. We come together not to complain about one another, not to gossip about one another, not to drag down one another. We come together to encourage one another, to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. God has given us one another to serve as an encouragement to one another, to boost one another. If I'm having a problem, I ought to be able to share that problem with my brethren. Why don't we do it more? Because then people start talking about us. Instead of helping us, instead of encouraging us and boost us, they talk about us. Did you know what brother so-and-so did? Well, they don't need to know what brother so-and-so did. They need to know that maybe he needs help, and you need to help him. I want you to consider the example of Barnabas. Barnabas is a wonderful individual. He's one I call, we, we normally think of the apostles as the, the ones who spread the gospel. Well, Barnabas was one who spread the gospel also. And I like Barnabas because I, those who were here before, I told you earlier, I, I was on basketball teams and, and athletic teams when I was in school, but I was never a first string player. I was always a sub. I was on the second team. Barnabas, in a sense, was on the second team. He wasn't an apostle, but it didn't stop him from doing what he could to boost others, to encourage others. As a matter of fact, Barnabas wasn't even his real name. Look at Acts 4, verse 36. Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the, city, of the country of Cyprus, having lions sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Can you imagine that? I don't know how much land it was. I don't know how much it, were, it was worth. But this was a fellow who saw the need among his brethren. So he had some property and he sold it and he didn't keep the money. Now we know in the next chapter, Ananias and Sapphira did that and there were serious repercussions. But here was Barnabas. 
doing what he could to help his fellow saints. And they recognized that, son of, one like unto, encouragement. He was a source of encouragement to those people. And he was such an source of encouragement to them that when they heard that the gospel had been preached in Antioch of Syria and that there were brethren there now, the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to them. Acts 11, verse 20, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Right there is a faithful man. And look how he's described. He was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit, allowed the teachings of the Holy Spirit to dwell within him and to form his character, his attitudes, his actions. And he was full of faith. He was a faithful individual. And he encouraged not only the saints in Jerusalem, but the saints now in Antioch of Syria. And of course, we know that he went on the first journey with the Apostle Paul, going with the Gentile world, experiencing many of the things that Paul experienced of an adverse nature as they traveled together. We have him and others as examples of what it means to be those who encourage. We talked about discouragements on Sunday morning, but in the face of discouragements, in the face of limited abilities and resources, they continue to be supportive of the work and devoted to the Lord. They're not like the boosters of a team who can only be enthusiastic when that team is winning. They endure the bad times as well as enjoying the good. Every congregation is going to have ups and downs. Those who are faithful remain faithful no matter what. And they remain supportive. And they remain liberal. In our day and age, liberal, the word, has gotten a very bad connotation whether it's in the things of, of uh, spiritual nature or especially it seems in the minds of many in politics. But this is liberal in the positive sense of being willing to share. We talked earlier, or at least cited earlier, the Macedonians. Let's read that passage where Paul describes them in 2 Corinthians 8. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord then to us by the will of God, there's the key. You first give yourself to the Lord, wholly submitting to him, allowing him to rule your life and guide your life. Become totally devoted to him in the service of him. And then give yourself to your brethren and live for them. Encourage them, boost them. Be aware of their needs, whether they're physical, whether they're financial, whether they're emotional, whether they're spiritual. We ought to be watching out for one another and caring about one another. And let that, how you doing, be more than just a way of greeting. How are you doing? You having some problems? I have a very good friend who I encourage to go into preaching, and he doesn't hold that against me, by the way. Uh, and so he's, he's moved about 100 miles away from where we were in Tallahassee. Now he's about 200 miles away. But every once in a while, he'll just call me, and he'll say, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? What's up? How can I help you? That means an awful lot to me. And I know I'm not the only one he does it with. And it's caused me to be more concerned about others and see how they are doing. 
But you can only do that if you're willing to share yourself, first with the Lord and then with others. These are liberal. They're willing to share their money, their time, their abilities, their love. Stingy people never prosper. Never. They'll always have a bad outlook on things. We need to be those who are freely willing to be generous with ourselves to our Lord and to others. As we bring our lesson to a close, I want to close with some questions, and you might, if you have the outline, see them on there. Are you one of those people that the church can't get along without? Ask yourself if you're a member of this church. How would this church fare without me? First of all, would they even miss me? We've had people over the years, they drop in every once in a while, and somebody said, oh, what happened to brother so-and-so? I haven't seen him in a long while. Well, even as elders, we couldn't even track him down. He was gone. Not a word said, not a goodbye given. But what about you? Would this church miss you? if you were no longer here? Would there be a void in the fellowship here? Would they feel that void? Would they be filled with sorrow? Or are you a source of anxiety and sorrow? Again, over the years I've dealt with people that were constant complainers. It was always a problem, there was always something wrong, there was always something lacking. And it could never be satisfied. Never be satisfied, no matter what you did. And it was an irritant. Somebody told me one time they thought Paul's thorn in the flesh was a complaining brother or sister. I, I don't think that's the case, but it could be. Or are you a joy in the crowd? I started preaching the gospel in a training program in Down the Grove, Illinois. And uh, they asked me to first stay for two years, and then the two elders came and asked me to stay an extra two years to teach in that training program. And I was very pleased with that. But time moved on, and I moved to Evansville, Indiana, then Mount Vernon, Indiana, and finally to Tallahassee, Florida. And I had not seen either of those elders in many, many years. One of them had passed away, but the other was still living. And to my surprise, and to my joy, I got an invitation to preach a gospel meeting at the church where he was an elder at that time. And not only did I get that opportunity, but Sandy and I got to go and stay in his and his wife's home. It was a wonderful week in so many ways. But as he and I, as we were nearing the end of the week, and he and I were sitting together in his house, he looked over at me and he said, I want you to know something. He said, the times that you were at Downers Grove, he said, were the best times there. And he'd been an elder there for a number of years. And he said, you're my joy and my crown. I cried. If someone thinks that way of you, how wonderful it is. You don't do what you do as a Christian to, re to get a pat on the back, a well done. But oh, it's nice if people think that way. Are you a joy in a crown? Do people look to you for encouragement, for help? Are you an asset? Or are you a liability to the local congregation? You see, it all comes down to a matter of attitude. The attitude you need to have is whether or not you will serve God and others with all your heart, soul, and mind. Until the Lord and his people are your everything, you're going to be a nothing. And I know that's a harsh statement to some, but I believe that's the case. I need to give myself fully to the Lord. And when I do, I'll be a better husband, a better father, better grandfather, 
I'll be a better preacher. I'll be a better elder. I'll just be a better person all around. And that's what the Lord expects of me. And my friends, that's what the Lord expects of you. Will you be that joy and crown where people see you and not shy away from you or say, oh, there they are again, but look to you with joy and happiness, knowing that you are a faithful Christian in every aspect of the word. If we can help you be that tonight, we can pray in your behalf and go before the Lord and he will help you. Or if you need to come to Jesus Christ, possibly for the very first time, and give yourself fully and wholly to him, you can have the salvation of your soul. And you can be born into a new family who hopefully, and I believe they will, embrace you and love you and care for you and allow you to grow and mature and help you do that along the way so that you'll ultimately grow into the image of Christ. And at the end of your life, you'll be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. If we can help anyone make their life right, what it should be in the sight of the Lord, why don't you let us? Why don't you come forward while we stand and while we sing?